So um, I'm I'm working for uh, Durham University the, as as part of the support team for the Durham well the local local resilience for which I'll talk about a little bit later. But um, it's a COVID nineteen community health and social care modelling team. So it's a team that was put together to to help the the local government um, with their COVID nineteen planning. Uh, this work was done with. Pete Barbrook Johnson, who was at Surrey and is now at Oxford, and Camilla Caero and Brian Castellani, who are both at Durham. And I also can't forward my slides. So, okay. So, the way I am structuring this is I'm going to talk from a chronological perspective. So, there, there's been distinct phases, um, and I'm presenting a model and, and how that model has been used. And so, um, back at the beginning, we sort of did the development. Um, then we had some, some time where we were under, using the model to understand specific options, and then it's sort of been integrated into the, the standard, uh, into the ongoing policy planning processes. So for each of these periods, I'm going to talk about the context, the policy engagement, the content of the model, and what sort of data we were using and generating. And then at the end, I'll, I'll just going to end with some reflections which are particularly focused on how the model has been used and this changing relationship between the model and the models, I guess, and the, the policy process. So just to give you some, you know, who the key players are. Um, for those who don't know, the Local Resilience Forum is, uh, they, they're set up under an act um, and they have the legal responsibility for coordinating emergency response at a local level. So. This, this can be anything from, you know, floods and, um, you know, snow emergencies, power outages through to uh, pandemics. So, the, so they, it's a partnership between a whole stack of organisations and the ones, of course, of particular interest at the moment are the police, who uh, also lead the Local Resilience Forum, the NHS Trust, and the um, county councils. Okay, so they're the key points. So um, our principal contacts all along have been with the Durham County Council and with the NHS uh, Trust, the County Durham and Darlington Trust. Um, this this uh, support team, if you like, is led, co-led by Camilla Cayado from Mathematical Sciences and Brian Castellani from Sociology. So it's always had this dual role of of providing sort of um, social health, but uh, mathematical technical um, support to the, the primarily the council. Okay, so that, that just gives you a, an idea of, if you like, who commissioned this work. So starting with the chronology, back in March, um, and I've just, what I've done is I've, I've taken, the Guardian has this headline summary type thing to give you a reminder. Um, please remember that I've reconstructed this in the last few weeks. So my, my memory of what I was doing back then may not actually be uh, true <laughs> in that sense. But anyway, back in March, we had, you know, the, the, um, the first wave had hit um, a, um, a lot of political concern and then the start of the, the first lockdown on, on the 23rd of March. So this is the, the headlines from the 24th of March. And you can see, you know, focus on lockdown, the, the uh, ever colourful house arrest from the sun um, and, you know, the, the serious stay at home, this is a national emergency. The sort of information that we had available over this period, March to May, is basically admissions per 100,000 population and also deaths. I'm not going to talk about deaths in this talk at all um, because I, 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 this model was focused on uh, hospital billing. Um, and uh, thankfully, um, Maria's lovely service was available by the end of this period and, and all of these sorts of pictures that I'm going to set the context um, are taken from, from the dashboard. Okay, so um, we also had a scientific context. So the, the models um, that had stimulated or motivated the, the lockdown uh, were criticised for 
so there was this 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 debate about how much science was driving the policy and and you know whether the science was right. Um, this is just one example in the in the journals that I I happen to read. Um, but it's um, very much about the debate about um, is were the models open enough. Um, and to some extent, there's a false choice here because you know decisions had to be made, and decisions had to be made on the information that was available, not the not the best information that was going to be available you know, in several weeks' time. So, just to help you understand what my model does as compared to other models, there's sort of a couple of broad modeling approaches. There's data-oriented models. So these are roughly statistical models. So these are things where you fit a, fit a regression to some curve and then you extrapolate that curve into the future. Um, and so these were very prominent early in the first wave um, because they were doing things like projecting the demand for hospital beds by fitting the, the, the initial part of the um, increase in admission. Um, and in these models, the interaction between uh, different components is expressed through mathematical relationships between variables and parameters are calculated based on, you know, you're fitting a curve. And you're working with aggregated variables. The other side, type of models are process-oriented models, and roughly these are mathematical models, and here you're representing the theory rather than representing the data. Um, and broadly there's compartment models, which are the ones that you'll, you'll see in you know standard epidemiology textbooks where you sort of talk about the population count um, the number of susceptible people the number of exposed people the number of uh, infectious people and um, you're talking about differential equations for people moving from you know the rate of change from susceptible to exposed for example and the ones my model is actually an agent based model which i'm going to give you a little bit more detail about but it is different from from these other types so first i have to explain what agent-based modeling is because otherwise you will have absolutely no sense of what, what i've actually done so this is a definition it's a computational method that enables a researcher to create analyze and experiment with models composed of agents that interact within the environment that's not an incredibly i mean it's a good definition but it doesn't actually help you understand what's going on so let's step away from covid for a bit um, in the pre-COVID days, if you were imagining going for, you know, whether, whether to sit at home and watch television or go for a walk or whatever, then you as an actor would have certain things that you think about. Are your friends available to go for a walk? Is it your habit to go for a walk? What's the weather like? You know, you're much more likely to go for a walk when it's sunny than when it's when you've got uh, pouring rain. So this is what we mean by agents that interact with an environment. The, the person who is aware of their social environment, their friends going for walks, but also physical environments like the weather, but they also have personal characteristics that influence their decisions. Then what we do is we basically simulate a bunch of these people and stick them in a the computer. And that's what we mean by to create, analyze and experiment with models. And we do that so that we can say, well, what if um, you're, the average attitude changes or what if the, the weather is different okay and that's what an agent-based model does it simulates in, at the individual level people with characteristics um, who can perceive their environment and who, who, uh, we then just sort of have have in this case an epidemic run so from the period march to may um, we were doing various types of support. Uh, there was some um, Italian, the Italian epidemic was a couple of weeks in advance of the, of the UK epidemic. So what we were doing was doing some data analysis that, uh, using a tool called Complexit, which Brian's responsible for, Brian has one, where what we were essentially doing is saying, well, look at what the Italian curves were a couple of weeks before, and then look at look at the UK curves at, at the regional level, see which curve matches best and use that to project forward. Um, we, there were a bunch of different models proposed. Um, and at this, this point, I built a very simple ABM that was really about demonstrating that um, the 
the individual level interaction le gives you different conclusions than you know aggregating things. Um, and this is a, this was essentially because um, there was a shortage of, of modelers with epidemic expertise, just, um, and and so this was part of the whole learning from each other um, experience about trying to make sure that our tools that we were developing were as robust as possible. Um, and this was all done. Uh, Camilla Kayo, uh, who is, as I say, the co leader of the support group, was our single point of contact with the local resilience team. She's also on the, the data cell that supports the, the council and things like that. And then by May, we had released version one of the model, which is called Just Social. And it has three key elements there's a transmission process. There's an epidemic state transition for exposed, simulated exposed individuals. And then there, there's various distancing measures. And we have some example scenarios to demonstrate functionality. So I'm just going to show a little bit of a video here. So this is, that bit all I'm doing there is, is showing you that there's some advanced bits that um, I'm not going to Deal with. This is the main interface, and what you do is you set up the, the simulation, start, go. Um, there's a, 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 a trigger point at which the social distancing measures start, um, which is about now. And you should be able, you should see that it will suddenly come, start coming down. Um, and then, you know, later on, um, as, as it came down, people became more complacent. And so the, the scenario actually says, well, we, we instead of having the sort of 50% um, distancing reduction that there was at the initial lockdown, then it dropped back to a 25% distancing reduction. And you can see that that wasn't sufficient to control the epidemic. Um, and then further lockdown measures would be introduced and that would bring it down again and so on. So that's what the that's what the model does under this particular scenario. Uh, so what's actually within it is, as I say, these three elements. So the first element is the state transition for infected people. So um, it's an extended You'll, you'll have seen SEIR, which is susceptible, exposed, infectious, removed. But basically, people start in a, in a susceptible state. There's a transmission process, which I'll talk about. They move to the exposed state if they've been exposed. Um, they, they initially are infectious with the, within the community. They may or may not have symptoms at that, at that point. Um, if they end up going to hospital, then they are assumed to be symptomatic because that's you know, part of the symptoms. But um, some people just stay in, stay infectious with the community and never have symptoms, and they either go to the new or um, well, they can't, if, 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 they, uh, if they die, they obviously have symptoms. Um, the ones that go to hospital, some portion of them go to will need critical care, some proportion will be discharged um, alive without needing critical care and some proportion will, um, will die in hospital without ever going to critical care. So this is the basic structure. Um, so some of the things that I obviously need to make that work is I need to know transition probabilities. What's the probability of going from infectious in the community to infectious in hospital? What proportion, you know, what's the hospitalization rate? I need to know things like durations in each state. How many days is somebody in this state before they go in, into, the, into this state? Or how many days are they infectious in the community before um, they recover? So to get those sorts of numbers, I used various, all of, all of the data sources that I used uh, publicly. So various Imperial College reports, um, because they had done some analysis. Um, ICNARC, which is the uh, intensive care um, organization they they were they were producing reports about things like you know the average length of hospital stay and the proportion 
who were dying and so on. The ECDC, the European, uh, European Commission for European Centre for Disease Control, something like that. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that we didn't really have any community monitoring. So the community duration was, was a big issue that we just had no idea how long um, how long people were infectious in the community. So I got that sort of information from ECDC, which had compiled it from various sources. And the Office of National Statistics, um, they were doing, by May, they had just started doing some prevalence testing, and they, they were also responsible for all the, the deaths reporting. Okay, so that sort of combination of data sources populated all the parameters in this. The second thing I needed was a transmission process. And here, this is this basically that has, if you remember the the um, model that has a sort of a, a big grid in the middle with a bunch of one bunch of blue dots in them. Those blue dots represent susceptible people. And this is just a blown up version of a three by three square within that. And basically the, the, the world is 41 by 41 patches. And infectious people can expose susceptible people on the same patch with some probability. And each day some people move. So this is this is one day, and then this is the next day, the same region. And you can see that this blue dart has become a small orange circle. So that person, that simulated person has been exposed. This big orange um, circle is a is a currently infectious person, so they're so they're potentially infecting everybody in, in this square um, and people move around. So this, this the blue dart um, is somebody who wasn't there in the previous time step. Okay. Now, what I, this is a fairly rough sort of transmission process. Each patch starts with 12 people a day, there are 12 people, and that's based on literature because the literature has that as a, as a normal, um, baseline, no, no epidemic level. There are about 11, each person on average has about 11 contacts per day that are sufficient to transmit um, influenza like illness. Um, the transmission probability, like how, how I sort of said, well, what's, what's the proportion, what's the probability that any, uh, any infectious susceptible pair will actually transmit? I matched, I, what I did was I matched my uh, simulated epidemics to curves produced by the University of Pennsylvania model, which was at the time, um, and it, it still is, it's a good model, um, the, the sort of the best cal calibrated to available information. And then the third layer is the various policy options that go into the scenarios. So what, one thing that I have that I really haven't used much is that um, if the hospitals get full, then there's a higher probability of death um, rather, because there's no hospital bed available. Um, so I'm, I, I, I won't cover that one in detail because the, NA, the beds have been full, but we've never got to the point, I don't think, where, um, where people have had to be turned away and and have died as a result. So that hasn't been in any of my scenarios. Um, the next group is about reducing activity levels. So this is this is policies like closing public places and so on. And basically that just reduces the probability of transmission. Um, hand, promoting hand hygiene, masks, those sorts of things also reduce the probability of transmission. Shielding those at higher risk um, so within the model, individuals can be, can be um, isolated or not isolated. And if they're isolated, then, then they have a much lower transmission risk, both, both becoming infectious and transmitting to others. So it's effectively an isolation. So, so people who wear a shielding policy in place, then I, I'm just treating a proportion of the population as if they are in isolation. And then another um, type of policy is reducing movement. We haven't seen this much in the UK, but in, in the Republic of Ireland, for example, people were not allowed to go with, go outside. Um, I think it was five kilometres, so that's you know 
three miles um, without without a good excuse like visiting their GP or something. So they actually weren't allowed out of their local level. Um, and that's available in the as well. And then the third group of, of policies is about what happens, what's, what do symptomatic people choose to do? Um, and this is not the infectious people, this is the symptomatic people, because if, you, if you're not symptomatic, then if you don't know you're infectious, then you're not going to go around informing people that you've, that you've um, been associating with that you're, that you've got COVID. So symptomatic people can choose to isolate themselves and, and or they can choose to inform their recent contacts. Um, and you can, all of these policies can be implemented, uh, you know, to a greater or lesser extent at various times during the simulated epidemic. Now, these are not calibrated in the sense that um, they are set by the user rather than rather than automatically rather than having some number that is is um, dependent on something else. The, these are part of the scenario setting. So so the model users actually set the, the, the um, scenario parameters. So going back to the main interface, here's where the epidemic stuff occur, um, the parameters for the epidemic and summary statistics about you know the number of infectious people at the moment and so on. Here's the world I was talking about, about blue darts, and you can see that there's some people, um, the green ones are, are, are recovered and the, the, um, the little orange houses are, are people in hospital, for example. Um, and over here is the controls, on the right-hand side is the controls for the various scenario measures. Okay, so that's the model. What were we doing with it? So back in May 2000, uh, 2000 May, back in May 2020, um, we introduced the model. You know, we built it by then, version version one. And what we were doing was we were showing how different scenarios, the implications of different scenarios. So um, so so things like uh, there was a lot of talk about the target of R being one. Well, if you if you if you get R equals one, um, then all, what that means is that the epidemic is just ticking through, staying at the current current levels. It doesn't actually disappear. And then when you, if you like, ease the restrictions again, you're at the same point as you were at the beginning and it just takes off again. Um, other things that we were looking at is, well, what sorts of levels of, of contact tracing do you need to be able to control the, the epidemic and um, and basically uh, the yellow line here is is about combining a whole bunch of different scenarios with different policies and that that was what we were showing here is how to use the model but also about things like lots of little bits of policy is actually much more effective than you know one policy at a time we were also trying to emphasize the uncertainty um, so on the right hand side is, um, is some simulation traces and the dark line is the average over time for each of the different scenarios. And you can see that there's you know, massive variability that, um, that the, the model can't say, well, it's going to be you know, this value next week. That's not how models work. And one of the things that we were trying to do is, is get people away from that sort of level of thinking that this has got the magic number in this. Um, and so we were emphasizing the level of uncertainty in, in the simulation results. So then we move on to June. And, um, and in June, we had, well, I was working for Durham here, of course, you know, Dominic Cummings actually went to Durham while infectious to hide out on his parents' farm. Um, so there was there was you know a lot of a lot of pressure, um, a lot of political pressure to to ease lockdowns. You know there was um, on the twenty fourth of June we had the summers back on type headings. Um, we also started seeing you know people starting to book holidays and things like that. Um, 
And at that point, he was still getting, so, so we've added a month here, still getting a, a continued decline in admissions. And so what, what we were doing with our model at the time was, um, was st starting to work with the policy makers that they were asking questions. We were, we were developing some scenarios ourselves, but they were also starting to ask for scenarios. So this particular scenario is one that was about, well, if we get 40% contact tracing effectiveness or 60% contact tracing effectiveness, what will happen? And at this point, the dashboard also started giving us, um, I know we already had actual, so um, the, the charts that I started producing at this point had um, a mix of the black lines are model scenarios and the red dots are the UK actuals, okay, so the per, per 100,000 population. Um, at that point, we did not have any final resolution um, on admissions. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, don't be too impressed by the, by the curve following the red dots. It's hand-tuned. Um, what, we, what we're trying to do is, is get a hand-tuned scenario that follows the red dots to sort of say, well, this is a plausible epidemic that's occurring, a plausible simulated epidemic. So that then when we extrapolate into the future, um, we're starting from a from a realistic type of epidemic in our simulated population. So the, the idea here was that the local planners were asking questions of interest to them rather than just receiving the centrally generated reports and estimates. Um, Public Health England at the time were producing, um, you know, this is what our model says is happening in your area, which didn't look a lot like what was happening in your area. Um, and also to, to stimulate discussion. So one of the results of, of this particular scenario was um, that even the 60% effectiveness was not sufficient by itself to control, in the contact tracing, it's not sufficient to control the epidemic. So um, relying solely on that was, was not enough. And so there was a discussion with the policy people at the time about, well, I, I remember one of the questions that I was asked was, well, why did you, why have you got such low numbers in there? And I was saying, well, because you've got things like surveys of taxi drivers saying that, you know, they can't stop working um, just because they, they're feeling unwell. Um, and, and so the, the conversation was about well, what sort of support can be given in the local area to help people who need to, who, who want to isolate but are unable to, um, to give that, what sort of support can they be given? Um, so another thing that we did was, this is, was a scenario that basically the, the black line is the simulated is a scenario that was constructed um, basically depending on, uh, at, so I'll start that again. The, up to here, the, up to the sort of June was this history. Um, and then as we, as we eased, then um, the epidemic grew again in the, in the scenario. And so this was saying, well, at what point would there be sufficient alarm to have a second lockdown or, you know, a set, set of restrictions or whatever? Um, and so come up with a scenario that reflects uh, the different levels of, of alarm and apply that based on UK averages, um, but then use exactly those dates of different levels of restrictions and apply it to what to the, the lower starting prevalence that had occurred in northeast England. Okay, so um, the UK averages include you know, London, which had a, a much higher early exposure to the epidemic. And, um, and so the blue line is applying exactly the same scenario, but with a different starting level of prevalence. And you can see that what happens is that um, in the, the blue line, the second wave is much higher and lasts longer than it does if you actually if, um, start if you start your, your controls with the higher level of prevalence, and that's because there's less herd immunity within the population. 
Okay, so so this was just to, to try and understand. Uh, this was a scenario, as I say, proposed by the policy makers to try and understand what decisions made in UK at the UK level, what potential implications that has for them at a local level. Um, so after summer, we start to see a rise again. And at this point, the dashboard is starting to give us um, NHS regions. Northeast Yorkshire is the relevant NHS region. So we have admissions at both um, the UK level, which is the, the lo lesser, lower green line here, and at the Northeast and Yorkshire level, which is the higher line. Um, and and this was this was throughout October you start getting calls for we need more restrictions and then um, a, the second lockdown was announced um, from the, well, on the first of October first first of November. So um, at about this point I made some minor changes to the model. Effectively, so I released version one point one. I reorganised the code because by this point we, we had lots and lots of different scenarios and, and so I, I sort of separated them out into, into separate files. But importantly, uh, I did some parameter updates because now we had an extra few months of data and, and things like the, um, the ONS infection surveys had now been running for long enough that, that I could actually look at the proportion infectious within my, within my simulated population and compare that to the sorts of numbers that the ONS surveys were getting, so that I had some other calibration sources. Um, so that gave me, in particular, a much better estimate of the proportion uh, of the hospitalisation risk, you know, the, purport, the probability that, given that um, somebody has um, COVID, what, what likelihood do they have of going to hospital? This is also when I drafted a journal article because, you know, in academia, if you don't have a journal article, you couldn't do the work. Um, but the point of drafting the journal article was mostly about organising my, my process and documenting the process and that's and uh, updating the process. So at this point, we're now in November, um, we, we were, had a historical scenario to provide a, a plausible epidemic. And we extrapolated with different assumptions of the activity levels and several else isolation once the second lockdown finishes. And we were starting to do regular reports every fortnight where we were, where we were tracking the actuals using the, the dashboard against our projections. Um, and over this time, our model gradually became embedded in the, the uh, Durham County Council and the, the local trust, their planning dashboards. Basically, with equal status with the projections that they were getting from the Public Health England. And around this time, we also presented it to the leadership of the local resilience forum because it was starting to be used. And the sorts of things that we were doing, this is a sort of a, a, a plot from one of the reports at the time. Um, so you've still got your red dots for your actuals, and you can see that the the calibrate the you know the hand tuned epidemic is now out to December 2020, and then there were those four different assumptions of potential uh, easing, potential activity levels post the end of the second lockdown. Um, so. Um, and we, we had admissions data and you know that that looks quite reasonable and then I think I think it actually came into this the second highest line was tracking really well for admissions but then the dashboard gave us beds uh, gave us um, yeah, beds and actuals and we beds and admissions and we discovered that while CDB matched really well for at 4.7% of the northeast of Yorkshire um, beds, it were it, the admissions actually was quite different. So we were using the northeast of Yorkshire admissions, which is the red dots, but the blue dots here are the CDD admissions, and you can see that they actually peak 
quite a bit higher than the northeast New Yorkshire average, even though these are population adjusted numbers. So, um, and we, ha we ha hadn't been aware of this before doing this matching process in, uh, in November, December. So this is this, this sort of the final, the final thing, as I say, that this, we, we can now get data at the CDD level, at the um, local authority level. So for us, that, that was the CDD. And we were getting beds data as well. So um, this is information downloaded from the, from the dashboard. Um, and and there, now there's new conditions that we need to build into our scenario. So in January 2021, we were getting the, the new variant, which has a, a, which is about a 50% higher um, probability of transmission. Plus we were starting to get vaccination. Uh, we were having to plan for vaccination. And, there, and of course there was a third lockdown. So, um, so now we have three activity levels projected from the 29th of December. The third lockdown actually started, uh, I think, the 5th of January. Um, but there happened to be some pretty bad weather um, around then. And so basic, and people also anticipated the lockdown and started reducing their activity, as you can see by people using Google mobility data and stuff like that. So we actually started our activity levels from um, from 29th of December, which were reflecting different assumptions about how much people would actually respond to the lockdown and reduce their activity. We had to make it 50% more transmissible. Um, and we also started accommodating the, the um, vaccination by reducing the probability of that pathway from community infection to hospital death. Um, from the 3rd of February, because uh, basically that was the point at which a significant proportion of the older age groups um, were sufficiently vaccinated, but the vaccine, uh, the, the vaccine response takes a little bit of time. So we, we have in the model that from the 3rd of February, um, there's a reduction in the, in the hospitalisation and death rates. Um, now, these scenarios were actually, at this point, we've got much greater level of policy engagement. It's not just them proposing a couple of scenarios, but we were actually negotiating these scenarios. So they, they were the ones who selected what the activity levels were to be, to be uh, simulated in our scenarios. Um, while it was me that proposed how to deal with the new variant and the, and the vaccination, um, so that was discussed extensively with them about whether that was something that they were comfortable with, whether they had other approaches that they'd like to, like to discuss and so on. Our projections are again in the planning dashboards. And again, we had the, the discussion not just with the CVD, but also with the, the higher level, the, the, the resilience form. So those, um, those reports look pretty similar to the previous report, but now you can see we've got the three scenarios being projected from uh, January, from December the 29th. Um, and again, you can see that the blue dots of the, um, the cabin Durham uh, are higher than the red dots of the Northeast of Yorkshire. Um, they not only went up higher and more quickly, they also descended more quickly. So uh, we, we didn't actually end up putting in a correction. So that's the chronology. Um, we've got one more set of scenarios that we're currently building that's about um, you know, higher levels of vaccination and, and the end of the current restrictions. But I, we, haven't, we haven't put them into the model yet. Um, so, I just wanted to finish with some reflections. People talk about the different modeling methodologies and there's sometimes discussion about this is better or this is worse. No model is better or worse. The different methodologies have different strengths. Um, Agent-based modeling is particularly strong at thinking about the process. So because you've got this series of actions and consequences, 
and very agent-centric thinking. So effectively, the computer simulates, you know, I, the agent, have certain characteristics and beliefs and information about the world around me and therefore will decide on some action. So simulated individuals within the model decide whether or not um, they are going to inform their recent contacts and the model actually knows that who their recent contacts are. When I was doing the, introducing the, the new variant, um, some of the simulated individuals had the new variant and some of them had the old variant and the ones who had the, the new variant, when they infected somebody in the model, then the new, then the, that person was infected with the new variant. And so the new variant gradually comes to dominate in the population just because it's more infectious. There's certain things I would do if I could rebuild it. Um, a particular one is about the age structure. When I first built the model, there was no, there was no real, no, and there's still not a lot about um, the risk gradient by age structure. Um, it would be nice to put something in about that, but it, but there's a, a trade-off here about you know, making the model complicated um, versus usable and whether you have the information to, to produce that. There's certain things that even now I would not include. And those are particularly about high resolution transmission. So one of the things that you can do with agent-based modeling is you can actually have, you know, people moving around, going to work, going to school, things like that. Um, that's all great. You know, you get this lovely transmission process. But if you don't know what the risk is of transmission at your workplace or at your school, then you can't calibrate it. So it's kind of pointless to have that much level of detail in your model. I also specifically exclude things like the social effects of policies, things like, you know, what is the effect on people of being isolated for long periods of time or, or, or the effect on school kids of not having access, but not going to school? Those are not things that I feel should be part of the model. They are part, they are things for the policy discussion about the, the, the consequence. You know, the model says, this is what you need to do to control the epidemic. Then it's up to the policy discussion to think about, well, what are the consequences of that? You do not want um, some sort of hidden number within a model that says this is this is a good decision because you know the the average cost is is something or other. Um, it's easy to think that the that these scenarios and and the projections are the important part of the modeling project, but the indirect support I believe is equally important. The policymakers get experience with complex systems thinking. There are counterintuitive outcomes. They get them to train their intuition. So when they have to make decisions, when there's limited information, those decisions are better informed by their, their greater understanding of, of what potential consequences are. Um, and they can understand uncertainty. So what is the sort of the plausible prevalence levels in their community? And, and think about their assumptions explicitly. So that, that track and trace compliance number that they had been thinking that you know people would do it while well, um, facing having to put uh, assumptions into your model makes those assumptions explicit and, and forces a discussion about those assumptions. So the model, the insights that you get from models are not always the obvious ones. Models are really about a, they're a tool for thinking. They summarise the knowledge and, and sort of extrapolate that knowledge. Um, and as a consequence of that, the paper that you know I said that I, I produced actually talks a great deal about what I've ended up calling justified stories. Now, what if analysis is always something that has always been part of modeling? But what I was thinking about was why is what if analysis actually useful? And it's useful if two things have happened. The first is the stories aspect, that there's a sequence of events, so it's dynamic that are coherent and internally consistent. And that's what makes a story a good story. If you're reading a novel and, you know, characters just randomly do things, that's not a good story. And you'll stop reading the novel. So that internal con consistency and coherency for the sequence of events is part of what makes a story a story rather than just um, a random a bunch of um, ideas. And then the justified part is 
is that the model represents knowledge about the world. So uh, an agent-based model brings in uh, multiple sources of knowledge, data and theory and expert opinion. And so that becomes, that justification is about it being externally consistent, that the model is plausible given the level, given the knowledge about the world. And so my conclusion is, um, this is taken straight from the paper, really, um, that decisions may need to be made quickly with incomplete information. And, and the local planners have become more deeply engaged with the model over time. And the model has only ever been about these justified stories. So because they have, they have substantial time pressures, um, so this high level of engagement demonstrates that this sort of formalised what if is very important, um, that they are willing to commit time uh, and energy into this, says, says that that is of value to them. You can get the model and the model documentation from you know, my GitHub um, or from OpenADA, which is a, a model repository service. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm happy to take questions.